start of the afternoon. We've got two speakers coming up next. We've got, they're both from Rainbow Honey Limited. And uh, first up is Philip Croft, who's going to talk on how they got involved and um, why, I guess. And following on from that will be Ray Butler, who will talk about her recent experience uh, working with Sue Covey and other queen breeders in America, looking at how that they can continue this trade and carry it on into the future. So first up, welcome Philip Croft. We got, we got involved, it's very easy to get involved in this project, so I'm just going to go through an outline of how we got, how we got involved and who we are and what we're going to try to do for the industry, because we saw this as an industry good project, it's not, it has to be run commercially, but it, it affects all the industry. So I'm here, <coughs> this is sort of the outline of what we're going to look at this afternoon. <coughs> Some of the very important things that we have to keep in mind, and they've been outlined several times this morning, would be that the resistance to treatments is going to, it's going to have a big impact on the industry. The cost of treatments is going to go up. We have to put twice the treatments in, it's twice the price. And even now we're paying a lot of money for treatments. Then we've got the chemical residues in the honey or in our bee products. So we've got to keep that in perspective too. And then the gene pool is the one that I've we've thought quite a bit about. The gene pool in New Zealand is getting smaller, and Andrew Matheson mentioned this when he wrote books and he even talked about this. And then there's been an article come out now in the American Beekeeper, and they've talked about their gene pool getting too small. And once you get to a certain size, then you could get in breeding. So this is what we looked like in New Zealand with the hives perhaps before 2000. The ones on the outside, they meant to be feral hives, and the ones on the inside, they are managed hives. So we had a big pool of genes, and we had this crossing with these, with the, the big pools, so that we did, weren't getting inbreeding even amongst ourselves. And I suppose, you know, there was the wild bees on the west coast that were coming in, but that, that was still another important source of, of genes. And then we had this crossing between the wild ones, and then there was a the crossing between the hives. And most years, this big pool, if we took one of these hives on the outside of this feral hive, and we sort of followed it. It had been in New Zealand for about 150 years, or that their family had. And they, they most probably believed that they were going to be here for another 150 or another many hundreds of years. But, so at that stage, they, their pools would go down, that, you know, like the winter would come and um, take out a lot of hives, food shortage would take out some hives. But then the, the next year or the year after, they would all come back up in strength again. But then in 2000, it all changed. The whole scene changed in 2000 <coughs> when we got Varroa because we started losing this big pool of genes. We started losing these hives. And then we went to this stage where we've lost that big pool of hives or genes. <coughs> and um, if we're not careful, we'll get to a stage where we're perhaps just down to a few lines of bees in New Zealand. And at that stage, then we've got big problems with inbreeding because we, those, those bees, or those pools, different genes, they've gone now, they've disappeared. We can't bring those back into the equation. So when we looked at this from the start, we realized how important it was to be able to help to keep as many lines of bees going in New Zealand because that's going to be important in our future. And we realized that the the program needed to expect, you know, go to the next stage was perhaps taking it out to some of the beekeepers and we looked at perhaps um, being involved at that stage. We look, I also read quite a few articles put out by this chap, Seth Godwin, who talks about going from a dream or an idea and trying to get to achievement or, you know, you've got to get it to a stage where you want to get yeah. to and, there's a big, big gap in between, and he called it the gap, but it's not up on the board there. But sometimes that gap can be miles long, and you look across and you think, that's where I'd like to finish, but this is where I am now. And you've got this big learning curve, you've got all this hard work that has to go in, and you've got a lot of investment. And even beekeepers now, you're, perhaps you've got to look at the future and say where you want to be and how you want to see your bees, because even talking to better bees, there's going to be big changes, and you know, if we're not careful, we'll have problems with our breeding stock in New Zealand. The objectives of this, of the, of the work that Michelle and Mark have done, 
was to introduce this trait into the commercial lines of bees in New Zealand and to retain the genetic lines of bees developed by individual beekeepers. So they're pretty big um, sort of goals or initiatives that we wanted to perhaps commercialise or keep, keep in front of us because that's what we're trying to achieve. And even this one here, talking to beekeepers here at the conference, most beekeepers have developed a line that suits their district, that suits the beekeepers. And um, it's important that some of those lines are kept going. Preparations for this challenge, and it was a challenge, we, we looked at these points, and um, we've done quite a few different things. We've always looked outside the square, and we like to do something a wee bit different. We've got some experienced beekeepers. Um, we feel we're running with good hive management, and we have had a wee bit of breeding experience. These are some of our products we've bought out, and these were all new products that weren't on the market anywhere in the world, and we've developed some of these, nectaries, which is venom and honey, right through to the creams we bought out last year. And we, we, we do spend a lot of money and time on venom products. Um, we've been in business about 40 years, three generations, and we run about 2,000 hives, and we've got seven employees. Um, best, we try and practice best management practices for all our disease management, our hygiene, <coughs> and our honey. Um, just looking at the bar, well, we, we did start off as organic beekeepers, and we thought it would be easier if we got all our sticks in line, but we found it very hard to keep our organic status because the varroa had a lot more power than we realised. And we found that our hives would deteriorate very quickly, and then, especially in the autumn, like we were told before, if we didn't get those treatments in very early in February, our hives would start to decrease, and then we found it very hard to keep those hives alive because of perhaps um, the virus is coming in and taking them out over the winter. So we, we had to chuck that away and we've gone back to now just ordinary treatments. So in the spring we treat with thymol, we try and keep the organic in the spring. The autumn we, we go to something a wee bit stronger. <clears throat> and we do, our beekeepers do a lot of counting of mice, so they have a jar with them all the time. And most sites through the spring they will take two samples and they'll record that in their datables. <clears throat> we had a interesting exercise with with AFB. We had a lot of hives inspected this year and there was 12 hives marked, but only three of those came out positive and nine of them were negative. And then Marco came and did another, another follow-up just to check what had happened and found that all the hives he inspected were free of disease. Um, breeding experience. We've been breeding queens for quite a while. Uh, we, one stage we were exporting a lot of queens to Canada and we've slept, most of our queens have slept on temperament, honey production, the pollen collection and their wintering, wintering ability. Um, we did the scoping exercise and I suppose we, we really got into this by default because there was nobody else put their hand up very high or higher than us. So we went up, we spent some time with Michelle and we looked at what was involved if we took it on. And it's quite a, it was a really big exercise. But we looked at the equipment we'd need and the equipment's available, there's no problem with that. But this, so we took that one off. But the semen collection was quite difficult. It takes a lot of time and it's, it seems to be on and off and you can have a lot of things go wrong there. The storage is manageable. And um, then we, we did some mating of the queens. I've got a daughter that does um, AI on cows, and of course she gave me all this advice and said it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> so when I went back to her and said, oh, that no, wasn't the easiest she made out. Um, the cow's about 100 times or even 1,000 times bigger than the queen bee. And um, to her it seemed easy. But it's very technical. You know, if whoever's doing it has to get it dead right. And um, the virgin queens, we, we, made it some of, we took some virgin queens up to Hamilton and we tried to get those AI there. And then we found that anything that could go wrong went wrong. You know, we posted some back, half of them died. We took some back in the car, some of them died. Um, we learned an awful lot. We put them into queen banks and the bees destroyed them. So it's, it's really tricky to keep those virgins alive. They need to go back into the hives they're taken out of and those, <coughs> her own bees seem to look after her and appreciate her. Um, once they're, they're mated, you have all the same problems and a lot of work. 
Um, the fertilised queens, we found they were really sensitive the ones we brought back after they'd been in the hives in Hamilton. <coughs> and we got a, bit, a rate of about 50% of them survived. So that was when we decided we'd, if we were going to be serious about this, and we seemed to be quite running along with this project then, that Ray better go to the States and have a look and see if we could get all the answers to all the problems that we built up. I must say, um, I was going to say that there's a lot of old, old, but I should say familiar faces here. I haven't seen it seen for a while. Oh, thank you. You can stand there and hold it. And I'll sing the song at the end. Um, okay, so as, as I'll follow up from Philip, um, we did a lot of work with, um, when it was decided that we had intended to take over the project. Um, <laughs> Anyway, we we so we came up with um, um, an idea that we ran with with um, food and plant, plant and food, and then we had to then formulate a plan as Philip pertained to about how we could actually get into the project straight away. So. As he said, we were trying to um, you know, AI some queens and we were um, queen banking. We were also getting advice from over in America, especially off Sue Kobe, how we could actually um, do this and have the better results and things. And then, uh, after seeking her advice, I realised that I really did. Somebody needed to upskill, um, especially to keep this BSH trading alive that we had to do so we could get back into the, get it into the industry, uh, we really had to get onto it for this season. So for me to go over and have a season in America, as she put me a season in it, so that I could come back and be confident about it. Uh, so this led to um, talking with Sue and we formulated a game plan. So um, far from popular belief, I wasn't going on a holiday. I actually armed myself with some questions and I asked myself um, uh, what was happening in America, was it working in America. Um, my, my idea with the trait in a layman's terms, it's a polygenic additive, it's not a dominant or recessive trait, uh, therefore the more you can get it out there, the more it will build up and it more, uh, it's just building up the actual trait in the bee population. If you did that, well, is it, if you're going to do sort of crossbreeding and, and breeding, is this going to work? And then, of course, I really had to build up my confidence. confidence. Uh, so then, um, putting all my questions to Sue, she very kindly um, put me on her AI course, um, advanced um, artificial insemination course. She put me in contact with a lot of queen breeders, and then she was also very instrumental to me um, networking amongst the Queen Freedoms. So the first, first thing I started to do um, was I went on, I actually did an advanced AI course, but prior to the advanced course I also joined, um, helped to set up a laboratory for the courses, catching drones, and then also um, did a couple of days in the laboratory with uh, the two girls that I ended up working with, Queen Freedoms. And on this course, uh, you not only learning AI, which was um, highly technical, I must admit, but you also learned, um, met a lot of beekeepers from all over the world <coughs> doing the AI course for their own for their own reasons. And there was um, a Chile Chilean queen breeder there, a Polish researcher that um, he was also showing us his techniques, and he was also doing some studies on actually how you can release the AI bees into the beehives because um, everybody recognises that as a problem. Um, he's come up with some papers on that, I'm looking forward to reading. He was a Welsh queen breeder. He was an Englishman that was a commercial beekeeper in London with 40 beehives in Regent Park. And he was also a Brazilian guy that was actually breeding for um, Africanised bees. He had domesticated them in Brazil and he was teaching people how to um, uh, breed those. And there was also some a Filipino there working with Asian bees. So you know, even just in one class, we had a huge pool of information. 
So then to carry on practicing after the course, I kept, still kept in contact with Sue and she kept me in contact with a very good friend of hers, that was Queen Breeder. And I ended up uh, moving in with them and working with them for uh, over two months. And I uh, helped the two girls that I was working with, they also had um, AI skills. And we set up in, just like Sue started on, on her kitchen table, we literally set up in my living quarters um, the breathing and collected semen. Um, so then also while I was there, I was worked hands on within the Queen breeding outfit so that I could actually um, upskill by actually getting uh, my breeding skills up to up to speed, especially if I was wanting to do a cross breeding. Um, <coughs> uh, while I was there, uh, some Canadians Quebecans actually, they're actually going to be at the uh, uh, Bondi in September. Um, they actually came over and they were the biggest uh, organic beekeepers and queen breeders in Quebec. And they were actually just going to start to go into business with um, Be Happy Aprons and Breed Queens and send them to Canada. So that was interesting talking to them because then I found that there's a whole lot of networking going on. They were organic, but the Americans were slightly different. Um, beekeeping techniques as well, so they're going to be embracing each other in that. As well as working with breeders, I visited some breeding um, companies and the Conans, they were you know, fairly big size there, they were 60,000 colonies and they run uh, 100, they actually produced about 100,000 queens. Now you've got to appreciate that these guys in California, they only have a three month window to do all the queens, so it's a massive amount of breeding, breeding there. There was different things that we picked up, you know, like um, keeping your queen contained so that you actually could um, graft the appropriate aged larvae. So it's all, everything was all very convenient. And this one here was quite an inventor, so it was quite interesting to um, visit. I also visited um, Pat Heat Community <coughs> Bakeries. He did 30,000 had 30,000 colonies and 50,000 queens, uh, but he he um, had a totally different system to everybody else. And and all these beekeepers, they all have their own ideas on how to um, use your starters and finishes and things. So I sort of got some ideas of these guys. Pat here, he just didn't use any brood in his starters. He completely had them broodless and just put bog bees in and fed them lots of pollen. And then carrying on from that, um, my biggest visit was to going to um, Glen Apries and visiting Tom and Suki. Uh, now Tom and Suki, they actually breed for VSH Queens. Now um, they have been doing this for over 20 years and what they do is they actually, the USDA the United States um, Department of Agriculture, they actually have a breeding, breeding program and they actually carry on and do the total VSH breeding and then they put it out to the queen breeders who then crossbreed and then put it out into the commercial market. So they, they in fact, um, quite interesting to talk to because he does a lot of artificial insemination and that's the way they, they combat the, um, trying to get the gene lines genes alive so and that's when I realized well actually Philip and I have actually taken on the task of um, what USDA do as well as trying to get it, um, you know, the lines going and bring that to the breeders. Um, Glenn Aprey's run about 400 colonies and he did say he doesn't treat um, beginning varroa he doesn't need to but the only, one, the only hives he treats are the ones with um, his drone beds. Um, so that was an interesting insight. Uh, he, he, on his website, he indicates where all his VSH queens are going out to. Um, as far as I know, um, a lot of a lot of them, a lot of beekeepers are interested in the VSH trait, but I think it's like here, it hasn't evolved enough, it hasn't got out there enough, and there's too many other alternatives, um, too many hard trucks being used. Um, that, um, as well as um, meeting the Queen Breeders, um, I met a lot of people that were, um, had their own breeding programs like Albert Robertson, as well with the Reed Saskatraz project because 
Uh, he also incorporated some DSH bringing that and they do that in Canada. Uh, Bob Danker, I'm now in contact with him at the USDA, so let, uh, we've told him what our breeding program is and we're going to keep in close contact with him. <coughs> Um, other networking was I was privileged to go to um, a Be Informed program. It's actually an initiative that's been started by um, the uh, California uh, Institute, and they have put together, they've started what they call a B team. And I find this is really it's an interesting concept. Uh, Twelve brilliant queen breeders joined this group. Um, it was funded by the government, but they also put some money in to, uh, into it and the B team would go periodically around their beekeeping outfits. They would check for uh, nizema, uh, viruses, AFB, and do, uh, check for a hygienic trait, and then they would look, uh, also look at the um, management of beehives, of what sort of drugs they would do, and then they would graph everybody's results. And then they could work out what areas were actually had um, AFB, varroa, um, and and where the viruses were actually um, popping up. Um, then they were actually, they found these, they keep, everybody keeps anonymous because then they also <coughs> have to then tell the B team what drugs that they are using. And if these, a lot of them are using all types of drugs from organics to um, legal to illegal drugs. And then they're actually now going able to map what sort of drugs are working on the varroa and things like this. With this B team, they're actually even expanding on it. They're working with Sue um, Kobe, and they're actually going to be start, uh, she's going to be doing traveling around the AI and doing the AI with the BSH and any other um, queen breeds. So when I, when I talk to them about what our aim was with our project, I'm finding that um, they've actually, um, what we've come up, the plan we've come up with, they uh, seem to be involved as well. And we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, Randy Oliver, or if you go to America, yeah, everybody's going to meet Aunt Randy. Um, it was quite interesting. He's very, very enthusiastic and, and organic, um, and he loves oxalic um, acid. He's been, especially putting it onto his nukes from the breakfast. So it was all very interesting. Um, so I've been able to come back here and get into more. Um, sharing knowledge within our workforce, you know, like the staff training, development of my team, and implementing skills and the techniques that I've picked up. Um, it's quite interesting that we can actually now exchange some good ideas from within America and New Zealand, and also now Canada. So, moving on, um, our current goal for the season is That uh, is, um, we need to, now we've got all the various um, breeders, we need to retest for them, retest them. We've, we want to test all our hives, mainly we've um, wintered over 250 nukes that are actually um, uh, VSH queens, and we'll be testing them for VH for the trait, and then we want to then increase the VSH breeding. We're going to have about six lines and we need to keep them cross breeding them and keeping them going. And we also have to raise a lot of drones, especially from uh, the hives that we've, we've wintered, to collect semen. And then of course we have to build on um, the VSH uh, methodology. We want to actually be able to come up with, we're using, we have to come up, we're going to use the same system that um, Michelle was using to count the VSH trait, um, but we need to actually try and, um, it's very time consuming. So when we're doing the AI, we're actually going to carry on collecting the wings from the from the VSH queens, so we can actually hopefully one day get that um, test shortened. Uh, now, from, from what we're doing at the start of the season, by the end of the season, we're going to have um, an AI service to new producers, um, selling all hybrid, hybrid queens to the beekeepers. They understand hybrid queens are cross mated, but they uh, they will carry the drones will carry the uh, trace. 
um, brood frame testing, we've got to carry on with that and then hopefully come up with a VSAGE certification. So when we test all the brood frames, we can then um, have, have some way that we can certify that it's um, that, that high or that queen is of the trophy. <laughs> So that, that's why we're, we've, that's our program for this week. But we also want to, long, we're looking long term, we're looking at hopefully the cost of the testing will come down over the next couple of years. So we're, we're training up some ladies this spring that will be able to do this testing for beekeepers and for what we need to do. So we're, we're hoping that the fingerprinting, which means the DNA, will be able to be tested. And I think better bees will, we're going to perhaps talk about that later on as well because that means more beekeepers will be able to send samples in and have them very quickly. Um, we're looking at a service to beekeepers and we hope to expand our AI service so that um, beekeepers perhaps could keep their own line going and they could use the drones that they need to make with their line. Um, <coughs> Ray's quite keen to help beekeepers with developing a breeding service so anybody who's interested in that can approach it. It's very important to have beekeeper involvement because less, uh, less beekeepers take this up and say this could help them. Um, <clears throat> it won't go a long way. So we are this year offering to beekeepers, it's in the uh, circular, it's been put out on the benches, on the chairs. Um, we're offering to go out and to artificially inseminate six queens on the beekeeper's site because that, that way we worked it out that it would cover all the problems that we had with trying to made queens in Hamilton and then get them back to Nelson. So we've been the beekeepers would raise their own virgin queens to a certain age and then we could, somebody could go out with the semen and disseminate those queens. So this way the gene would slowly start to move into the different lots of bees around New Zealand. And it's long term, it's not going to have, it's not a silver bullet, it's not going to happen overnight, but if you can get in a level for a start and then just build that up over the next few years. So I thought with this project we're looking at two to three years to bring that level up. Most of the, bit, the queens that we've got at the moment tested up in Hamilton, they range from 40 rights to I think it was one at 80. But we're not sure what our levels will be in the spring. Um, so we, we really want to see the, this project go further. We need to be us involvement. And it's very important, I suppose that's the message we want to get out. If you've got a good pool of bees and it's giving you good honey crops, it's doing what you need it to do, it's been developed by perhaps your family or your business over a long time, you want to try and keep that going. So you've got the opportunity now if you want to get these genes that um, somebody could come out and inseminate some of your queens. And then you could watch those and perhaps put that into your pool of bees. <coughs> so that's about our talk, so I suppose we'll answer any questions. I hope that's not too brief. This question that comes to my mind is uh, a natural between or mates with a good number of drones in the air, and you're artificially inseminating. Do you homogenise the sperm when you're inseminating her, or how, how, how do you sort of get the same thing happening? We're like, sure I'm right. the six or seven or eight or nine drones. Yes, because a lot of the work coming out now says they make with 10 to 20 drones. So yeah. what we're doing at the moment is we've got six lines of bees that are, we're going to try and get established from this project. And we want to build each one of those, each line up to about 30 hives so that we we have then drones coming from that mother, which are giving us similar results to what the mother had. And then we would collect drones from that line of bees. So we've got one, you know, say one to six. So this year we might be using line one and two. And we will mix those two together. But it'll be a lot of line, lot of drones from line one, and a lot of lines from drone two, and they will be mixed together. So you mix that and then you give her one shot. Yes, yeah. There's a certain size. <coughs> like shell, you can ask Michelle, she's got the sizes, I haven't got the size of him, but very, very fine. The straws are really, really thin. And the semen stores quite well. It, you know, like it can be left in a room temperature for six or eight weeks. 
long before we even fridge would be better. But you don't have to freeze it like um, cow semen or sheep semen where they've got to keep it in nitrogen or very low temperature. And it's still viable, but it doesn't last long term. Like it's interesting that it, in a queen it will last up to five years, but in a straw it seems to have a lifespan of six weeks. I, I might get out of my ground from the yeah. shell. Yeah. So. <coughs> They can here, and that could actually constitute about um, ten to ten drones. So you're actually not just you're not using one drone. You're actually using a more than ten. Yes, yeah, that's one of them. Any more questions? You had trouble. Uh, Sending queens through mail. Um, when I buy queens, they always arrive um, through the mail. We're quite happy with a couple of systems. Um, is it different when you're uh, sending artificially disseminated queens? Yes, it's quite different. They're, more, they're quite more fragile, and I'm wondering if it's anything to do with um, the airline. No, there's no difference, but it was just simply that we were sending through version queens. Yeah, and so we were getting virgin queens artificially inseminating and then sending them back. And so they really need to be in a colony, you know, to protect them before, yeah, it's hard to see virgin queens. So, sorry. Oh, that's really good. No questions. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Cool.